we're in the book of Romans, started last week. Last week we looked at a, a hard truth, but a necessary truth, uh, something we have to be reminded of, and that is the fact that all of us are evil and wicked and depraved. And without that understanding of our, our wickedness, personally and individually, we're unable to respond to the gospel properly. We can't respond to the gospel unless we're willing to admit our guilt. Several years ago, I ran across an article of a, a doctor, an MD out in California, who was doing a study on his patients. He had come to the determination that many of the ailments uh, his patients had were caused by different emotions, uh, fear or, or depression or anxiety. And so he did a survey, uh, wrote several questions up, sent it out to several hundred of his patients. And, and when the survey came back and the results were tabulated, 87% of his patients said that they carried the emotion of guilt. Why do people feel guilty? Because they are. And we are. Why are we guilty? Well, we know, we said last week from uh, Romans chapter 1, we've turned from God. We've worshipped what was created rather than the creator. We have made our own standard of righteousness and tried to adhere to our own standard of self-righteousness all while breaking God's law. Now, those who are moral, Paul said, may attempt to keep the law, but if they're going to claim, if a moral person is going to claim the right to salvation because they kept the law, then they have to keep it perfectly. They have to be perfect. James in James 2.10 said, the one who fa fails at one point is guilty of breaking all the law. No one other than Jesus was capable of keeping the law and keeping it perfectly, and that's the standard that God set. Now, we might ask the question, well, why did God even give the law? Let me give you four reasons that God gave the law. First of all, the law reflects God's character, his absolute holiness. It shows us when you look at the law and, and how perfect it is and how it would make one holy, it reflects who God is. He's perfect and he's holy. The second reason God gave the law is that he wanted his people, the nation of Israel, his chosen people, were to be set apart and distinct from the world. That, that's what holy means, to be set apart. And so God gave the law to Israel because he wanted them to look different than those in the world around them, to be set apart and be holy and reflect him. Of course, we know that they didn't perfectly keep the law. And Paul said that the law was given, the law was revealed to show us, not just Israel, but all mankind, to show us our sinfulness. It's to make us conscious and aware of our sin. If there was no law, we wouldn't have any awareness of sin or, or of wrongdoing. The law shows us that we fall short, and it also shows us that we can't keep the law in order to be acceptable. That would never work. That leads us to the fourth reason that God gave the law, and that is simply to drive us to God's grace. When, when we recognize we are guilty, when our conscience convicts us, when as a believer the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, then it drives us to the grace of God. Paul in Romans 3.20 said, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. What is he saying? Well, if you're going to keep the law, be justified by the law, you have to be perfect. You have to be perfectly righteous to enter heaven. And we all know that if we have to be perfectly righteous, we are without hope. The requirements of the law must be fulfilled, and we know that the penalty for sin, the penalty for breaking the law, is death. 2 Corinthians 9.15, Paul said it this way, Thanks be to God for his inexpressible or undescribable gift. What is that? That's Christ. Because Christ was willing to come and pay the penalty for us. Now, understand that Christ first perfectly fulfilled the law. He was the only one who could do that. He completely fulfilled the law, and because of that, he was able to pay the penalty death for us. We had a debt, and we had no means to pay it. We didn't just have a debt. We had a debt with no resources, no means to pay it. We were completely bankrupt. Only Christ could pay our debt because he had no debt. You know, if you're bankrupt, Someone else who's bankrupt can't pay, pay your debt. They don't have the means for that. Christ was able to pay the debt because, our bankruptcy, because he had no debt in his account because he kept the law perfectly. Well, we're going to pick up in Romans in uh, chapter 3. If you've got a, a copy of God's Word, you want to read along with me in chapter 3 in verse 21. We're going to pick up there in just a minute. Before we do, 
uh, I'm going to make something clear regarding obedience to the law and, and to the commands of God. I, w- I want to be careful that while we understand that the law doesn't save, I want to be careful to understand that when we are saved, when we have come to faith in Christ, apart from the law, that doesn't mean we're exempt from keeping the law or from obeying God's commands. We can't accept Christ's payment for our sins and then go right on back sinning. If someone bailed you out of debt and you immediately spent yourself back into debt, what good is it? You know, at the very least, if you do something like that, at the very least, you've created offense by not valuing the sacrifice that was made for you. We can't, when we've come to Christ, dishonor the Lord by willfully going on in habitual sin and in a lifestyle of sin. We've accepted Christ's sacrifice for us. That should change the way that we live. In chapter 2 and verse 13, Paul writes these words, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Now, at first glance, that verse could seem to say that we can be declared righteous or earn right standing with, with God, have eternal life by keeping the law, but Paul's already stated that keeping the law will not make us righteous before God. We, we can't earn our salvation. Now, as Paul records, not just here in Romans, but in all of his New Testament writings, as Paul records what the Spirit has told him to record. Understand, these are not Paul's words. The Spirit of God impressed on Paul and all the biblical writers uh, what he wanted them to write, what he wanted them to record for us. As Paul does that all through his works, you know that Paul clearly affirms salvation by faith, not by works. If you think back a couple of years ago in our study of James, you know that James talked about the importance of our works, the importance of our actions. Well, Paul and James are not in conflict at all. James is saying that our actions authenticate our faith. He never says that they earn our faith or that they they get us in right standing with God. He's saying if we are in right standing with God, then it should show by our actions. And Paul actually here in chapter 2 and verse 13 is saying the same thing James said in chapter 1 of the book of James, verse 22. He said, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers. Well, Paul here in chapter 2, verse 13 says, we're not justified by hearing the law. The word hearer means one who listens intently. Now, you understand what Paul is saying? You may listen intently to the law of God. You may listen intently to the word of God. You may be in the practice of regularly attending a a church like this or, or going somewhere or reading the word of God consistently, but just listening intently doesn't mean you're justified. Just listening intently doesn't change your standing before God. You know that you can listen intently and be in passive agreement to something that someone says. You can just listen and be in agreement, but that doesn't necessarily change your actions or or change what you do. What's Paul saying in chapter 2 and verse 13? Well, first of all, for those who have not given their lives to Christ and received his righteousness, if you hear the gospel message you understand the truth, you understand the doctrines we're talking about, the doctrine of the depravity of man, the doctrine of God's grace. If you hear those things, that's not credited to you as righteousness. That doesn't go on your account and eliminate your bankruptcy, eliminate your debt. If you hear those things, you have to act on those things. You have to receive Christ by faith and make him Savior and Lord of life. Now, most of you watching today are already believers, so what does chapter 2 and verse 13 say to us when Paul says we're not declared righteous just by hearing the law? What it says is if you've accepted Christ by faith, it doesn't mean that you can then go and just live as you please. In fact, the true believer doesn't live as he pleases. The true believer, out of gratitude for what Christ has done, out of desire to honor and glorify the Lord, the true believer willingly obeys. Now, I wanted to take a minute there this morning because... I feel like there are many who claim Christ, and yet they take great liberty with grace. They might say something like this, I'm forgiven past, present, and future, so it doesn't matter how I live. Christ has forgiven me at the point of salvation of my past sins, yes. He's forgiven me of of my present, yes, my future, yes. But it doesn't mean that I can just go live however I want to live. Is he going to forgive my sin? Yes, but justification by faith is not about just accepting the work Christ has done and then going out and living any way that we choose. 
So let's look this morning at how we are made righteous by faith. In, in chapters 1 through 3 that we looked at last week, Paul has built a case against all people. Everyone is sinful. Every race, every tribe, every tongue, every people group, there's a universal need for salvation. Now he's going to spell out the way to be in right standing with God. And, and this is a radical plan. When you think about what Paul's going to lay out, it's a pretty radical plan because in our human nature, we're legalist. We want to earn our salvation. God gives it freely. We want to perform to do good. God provides it in spite of our performance. We want to demonstrate our worthiness before the Lord. But the law declares us unworthy, and only when we realize how incredibly unworthy we are can we fully comprehend the gospel. The righteousness God provides is based on what God did, not what we do. The righteousness God provides is based on what he did, not anything that we can accomplish. And, and Paul, in, in chapters 118 through 319, Paul, as he has laid out the sinfulness of, of all men, and he's explained in chapter 3, verse 20, that no one is going to be justified by what he does. Now he shows us the way to righteousness before God. Read with me if you have your, your Bible open, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 27. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then verse 27, then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Well, I love the way Paul starts this section in verse 21, but now. Paul has laid out all of man's wickedness. He's talked about all the things that man tries to do on his own to bridge the gap. All of those things failed, but now, what has God done? He has made his righteousness available through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Now, why is his righteousness made available to all? Look at the end of verse 22 going into 23. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all need his righteousness. There's no distinction. Not only is there not a distinction in race or class or socioeconomic, there's no distinction in moral, in man's eyes, and immoral. We're all the same before God. We all have fallen short. We all have sinned. But we don't have to live under the, the curse of sin and the penalty of our sin. Verse 24, Paul says, We're justified by his grace. We haven't earned it. We haven't deserved it. It's just pure grace. We're justified by his grace as a gift. How? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as the propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. His grace is a gift. Paul emphasizes again and again and again, we can't earn it. You know, one of the most difficult tasks for us as human beings is to accept God's righteousness as a gift. We just have such a hard time doing that. With everything in us, we, we want to earn God's favor. We cannot. It is impossible for us to earn the favor of God. Well, what's the gift? He says the gift is our redemption. The word redeem means to buy back. You know, we already belong to the Lord because he created us. But we chose to go our own way. We chose to make ourselves slaves to sin. So even though we already belong to him, in Christ he redeemed us. He bought us back. And that was achieved by God putting Jesus in our place. It was his blood that was shed. He was the death penalty. He was the payment for our sin. You know, God has decreed, we see in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. God has decreed that our sin leads to death. If we don't have some means of paying for our sin, the penalty is death, and we don't have the means of paying for sin. So what was the means? 
He says his blood was the propitiation. To propitiate means to remove wrath. It was the blood of Jesus that removed God's wrath from us. Again, in in chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 20, Paul showed that all man, all mankind is under the wrath of God. doesn't matter who they are, where they live, how good they are, how evil they are. We're all under the wrath of God. And he's saying here, it's the blood of Jesus shed for us that satisfied God's wrath. It removed God's wrath from us. Why? Because that wrath was all poured on Christ. Verses 25 and 26, Paul says, this gift revealed God's righteousness and his justice. Well, what about his righteousness? Well, he says that in his divine forbearance or patience, he held off punishing former sins. What's that talking about? Sins committed before Christ came. What about the people who were alive before Christ came, who uh, were alive and perhaps had already died before Christ died on the cross to pay for their sins? God held off punishing them. Now, that doesn't mean that their sins didn't matter. You remember looking through the Old Testament that the people in Old Testament times had to place their faith in the Messiah that was to come and the sacrifice that he was going to make. And what God required of them was that every year, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, sacrifice was made for the sins of the people. So every year they had to make sacrifice. Why? Because their sins were not wiped out. God in his forbearance didn't punish them, but the sins were still on their account. All that that yearly sacrifice did, the blood of those sacrificial animals just covered over their sin for another year. The sins were still on their account. They had not been removed or not been cleared. And yet God, in his patience, didn't punish them for their sin if they had faith in the Messiah that was to come and the ultimate sacrifice that he would make. But Paul says God's only righteous, he's also just. You see, if God just said, hey, I'm not going to hold this against them, no penalty, he wouldn't be just. He had already declared that the penalty for sin had to be paid, and the penalty is death. He's he's not unjust. He didn't just allow those before Christ to get off scot-free. They still had to make that annual sacrifice, and they had to place their faith in Messiah to come for us It's not something we look forward to. We place our faith in the fact that the Messiah has come and that he has done it. He has paid the price. He's paid the the penalty for us. So God is righteous. He dealt very, very righteously with people before Christ came and paid the penalty, but he's also just. He still required that a penalty, that death be paid for sin. But notice Paul says, too, that he is the justifier. He declares those who believe in Christ, he declares them righteous. They have the righteousness of Christ. They they have perfect righteousness. Here's what that means. They're in debt. They're bankrupt. He doesn't just forgive the debt. He doesn't just clear the bankruptcy. He completely wipes out the record. There's no record that they were ever even in debt. Paul explains it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake... He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what God did. That's a great exchange. Christ was not sin. He knew no sin, but he made him to be sin. What sin? Our sin. So that we could be what? The righteousness of God. Not that we earned it. Not that we deserved it. Not that we were good enough. In fact, the the technical term or the theological term for this is imputed righteousness. To impute means to attribute something, some, some quality on someone. The righteousness we have is not something we have in ourselves. It's not in our character. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. God just attributed it to us. He put it on our account. And, and there's, two, there's two facets um, to, to God's righteousness being imputed to us. The first is that our sin is imputed or attributed to Christ. Christ had no sin, he had no debt, he owed no penalty, but as he suffers on the cross, what he's suffering for is our sin that has been attributed to him. It's it's put on him. And then the good news is because he was willing to have our sin imputed to him, he 
his righteousness is imputed to us. Again, he doesn't just uh, forgive our sin, doesn't just cover it up as the Old Testament sacrifice did, but he completely wipes it out and his righteousness is imputed to us. He, he pays off our bankruptcy and there's not even a record of it. And not only does he pay off our bankruptcy, but he gives us his unlimited resources. That's what Christ has done for us. Jesus offers righteousness to all those who will receive it. It doesn't, it doesn't supplement our good works. We, we have no righteousness in and of ourselves. His gift alone puts us in right standing with God. Well, one final word from verse 27. Paul says, after explaining how we receive that righteousness, Paul says, hey, look, our, our boasting is excluded. Why? Because we come by faith, not by works. You know, when you, when you think about our, our tendency of wanting to be good enough, of wanting to earn our own way, there's a hidden agenda there. And the hidden agenda is that if we could earn our own way to right standing before God, then we'd be able to boast. We'd be able to brag about how good we are. We'd run around telling everybody, yeah, God, I'm, I'm righteous before God. He told me I've done so many good things. I'm such a great person. I'm so moral. No, Paul says we, we can't boast. That's excluded. Paul also addressed this in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, which many of you probably know or have even memorized these verses. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not as a result of works that no man can boast. It's by grace, love from God that we don't deserve. It's through our faith, placing our faith in the work that Christ has done for us and making him Lord and Savior of life. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Would you pray with me? I want us to take just a moment as we do every week and just open our hearts before the Lord and ask the Spirit of God who indwells us as believers to take the truth that we've just looked at in God's Word, His words, not my words, His words, and ask Him to take His words and show us how they apply specifically to us. You know, I, I think the first question we have to ask is, have we received the free gift of salvation? I'm not asking you if you attend church regularly. I'm not asking you if you read your Bible, if you pray, if you've been baptized. I'm not asking you any of those things. Those are all good things that should follow salvation, but I'm asking you, have you realized you're totally bankrupt? You have nothing in and of yourself acceptable of God. Have you thrown yourself on his mercy and asked Christ who died to pay for your sins, asked him to forgive you and accepted his payment and made him Lord of life. Many of you listening today are, are believers. You've already done that. And I guess what we need to ask ourselves is, is a couple of questions. One is, does my gratitude for what Christ has done for me, does it affect my lifestyle? As we looked at in Romans 2.13, God doesn't bless us just for being hearers, just for agreeing with his word and his commands. He blesses us when we obey. We're not to be hearers of the word only. We're to be doers. Am I living out the commands of God? Am I living out the truth of scripture in my life out of my gratitude and my desire to honor the Lord? Is my lifestyle affected? And one last thought. Do I realize that the gift that has been given to me is to be shared? You know, Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.20 said that he's become sin for us and he has given us his righteousness and that is followed immediately by Paul explaining that we are his ambassadors we have the ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? Men are separated from God. Men and women and boys and girls are separated from God. And we're to reconcile. We're to bring them together. How do we do that? By helping men and women and boys and girls understand the message of the gospel and what Christ has done for us. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you that the truth is clear. Father, help us to listen attentively, and then to act on what you have to say. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.